Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Charles Faint from the Simon Center for the Professional Military Ethic, where I serve as the center's deputy and direct MX400, the superintendent's capstone course on officership. On behalf of the Modern Warfare Institute and SCPME, it is my pleasure to introduce author, war correspondent, journalist, and friend of West Point, Mr. Sebastian Younger. This is not Mr. Younger's first experience with the US military, nor is it even his first time at West Point. Many in our audience will remember Mr. Younger as a highly acclaimed war correspondent who covered conflicts in multiple locations across the globe and who embedded with U.S. combat troops in Afghanistan. They may also recall his officership of books like Tribe and War and his work in creating documentaries Restrepo, The Last Patrol, and Korangal, which is screened here in this very room. These important works many of which are closely studied here at West Point, contribute enormously to our country's understanding of not only war, but more importantly, what comes after. We are honored to have Sebastian back at West Point and hope to host him here again in the future. Mr. Younger's work is not limited to military-related subjects. He is the author of The Perfect Storm, a best-selling nonfiction book that was made into a major motion picture of the same name. He is also known for his domestic investigative journalism and his coverage of dangerous occupations and dangerous places throughout the world. Sebastian Younger has repeatedly demonstrated his willingness to ask tough questions, to report facts that sometimes people don't want to hear, and that he is willing to take personal risks to get to the truth. It is a great honor to have him back at West Point. Also joining us today via VTC and conference call, are 15 ROTC detachments from across the country. As a 1995 ROTC commissionee from Mercer University, it is my pleasure to welcome our ROTC colleagues to this experience as well. After Mr. Younger's remarks, we will have a short question and answer session before his book signing at the Thayer Hall Bookstore. And now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sebastian Younger. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be back here. Um, really, and a pleasure and an honor. Um, I, I sat in on a couple of classes, and I got to say, you, you guys are, as you know, um, getting an amazing education. And I was really impressed uh, with the kind of conversation that was happening in those rooms. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to start my talk with an anecdote that it happened to me just a couple weeks ago. One of the interesting things about being on book tour is that you talk to people uh, who sometimes have read your book and actually have something to add. In fact, sometimes you think, wow, where were you when I was writing my book? Because you'd, be, <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be in it. Um, I was down at uh, Norfolk, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, at the naval base. I'd given a talk there, and um, the next morning I was leaving, and I was, you know, early outside the hotel, waiting to get picked up to go to the airport. And there was an older guy that wheeled himself out in a, in a wheelchair. He was probably 70, nice-looking man, um, missing the uh, half his right leg. He was bandaged, and had a, he had a wooden, um, a wooden peg, not a, not a prosthetic, uh, and he wheeled himself out and tried to tried to get into the passenger door of a car that was in the, uh, in the driveway there in front of the hotel, and, he, and it was locked. And so he just sat there. And I went up to him. I said, sir, can I help you? And, uh, and he said, no, I'm just waiting for my wife to come out to unlock the car. And then he sort of looked down at his le bandaged leg. And he said, um, I'm still, tr this, this is, re he said, this is recent. I'm still trying to figure it out. And um, I sort of thought about that, and I said, and I said uh, it just seemed, you know, here's a guy at 70, he probably didn't anticipate that happening, you know, and nor did his wife, of course, and here he is trying to figure it out at 70. And, and I said, you see, seems like you're very brave about it. And he looked at me like I was the biggest fool he'd seen all week. And he said, brave about it? He said, he said there's, there's young people missing both, both their legs right now. I'm fine. And, you know, it occurred to me, um, a couple of things were going on there. One was he, he, he was 
being concerned about other people, which is noble and, and good, and society needs people to do that or we stop functioning. But it also occurred to me that when, as he did that, he was actually not putting himself in a kind of victim role. Um, he was allowing, he was, his concern for others was allowing himself to um, get through his own difficulties without pitying himself too much. He was actually reducing his level of pain about the very real trauma that he was going through. And I thought it was such an amazing lesson in, in character and in, and in honor, honor and um, in just basic human concern for others. I really, I really and I want, you know, they don't give medals for things like that, but I wish, I wish we did. Um, that, that guy was just amazing. And we chatted a little bit, his wife came out um, that the wheelchair was really, a big steel industrial wheelchair was really heavy. She was 72, I helped them get it in the back, in the trunk. And I just thought, wow, you know, she's sticking with them. Like, and um, you just never know what life's gonna, what's gonna happen in your life. And the only way to get through it uh, is by counting on the love and concern uh, of other people. That's the only chance any of us have of getting through this crazy deal. Um, so I, that's the most recent thing that has really moved me in terms of, you know, the big question is how do we act in society? What are our, what are our, our ideals? It's easy to say, well, you should be generous, you should be patriotic. No one... It's like, thank you for your service. No one quite knows what that means. You know, I support the troops. Like, what exactly do those phrases mean? Um, that, that older gentleman, whatever his name was, for me was all of a sudden an example of how to act. Um, so my father grew up in Europe. I, uh, my mother grew up in this country. His, uh, his family, uh, her, her family came here in the 1700s um, and settled along the Pennsylvania frontier. Uh, when it was um, now a, a, a conflict zone. It was a war zone. And it was, it was a war zone populated by people living in indiv indiv often individual families in remote homesteads in the wilderness, vulnerable to a attack by the native tribes of the area that were trying to keep their land and their culture intact. Um, and in 1783, my, my distant ancestors on my mother's side um, had settled in Finley Township in western Pennsylvania, southwest of Pittsburgh, and the, the husband, the father, gone off to the, to the fort 10 miles away to do some business. The, the, mo the mom was left on her own with two teenage boys and an infant son named James. And uh, early in the morning, the boys went off to look for firewood, um, a Delaware raiding party had crept up to the wood, to the house in the woods and attacked and killed those two boys immediately and moved on the house. And the dog attacked the Indians and helped before the dog, obviously they, they killed the dog, but the, the, the dog fought long enough so that this woman, my distant ancestor, many generations ago was able to grab her infant son, James, and rush off into the, um, into the cornfields, and in the cornfields, she was able to evade the Indians and make it back to the town, and eventually they returned with an armed party. They buried their boys, and the family resumed living in that house, unprotected. Imagine the courage uh, required to do that, okay? Um, I'm descended from James, that infant. I'm alive because a dog, whose name I don't even know, in 1783 had the instinctive courage to confront attackers long enough for his master to escape. That cornfield's still there. I found that little plot of land. There's an old family cemetery with the stones broken and knocked over. James's tombstone is right there in this cornfield. Um, so, obviously, horrific situation. The Indian Wars, the border, the frontier wars were a bloodbath. One of the really inter interesting things about that, though, is that there was a phenomenon that was going on along the frontier that, that really puzzled people. Um, as Benjamin Franklin said, and other writers remarked, um, 
that there was a constant flow of, of young Americans uh, into, the, into, the, in, into these tribal societies, um, and, but there was no flow in the other direction. Ir Iroquois warriors were not moving to Boston to become accountants uh, or, or moving into the settlements to become farmers. Uh, but there were many people in colonial society that fled the strictures of civilized life uh, and, and, were, and joined native, native society. And even people who are captured, I mean, my, my ancestor, uh, this woman might not have been killed. She might have been captured and adopted into the Delaware tribe. Um, that was a common practice because they were replenishing their ranks from the decimation of warfare. Um, often people who had been adopted, forcibly adopted, after a year or two, when given the chance to be repatriated, they would refuse to. They would not want to go. Um, and this was something that was really puzzling and concerning to, the, to, to you know, white Christian society that saw itself as superior, and these were savages, and why would anyone make the choice to, 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 to live with savages, as they termed it? Um, many, many, uh, a couple of centuries later, uh, I, um, I was lucky enough to have a mentor, you know, sorry, an uncle figure named Ellis, who was half Lakota Sioux, half Apache. And he said to me, um, he said, you know, all throughout the history of the, this country along the frontier, as he, as he put it, white people were always running off to join the Indians. And us Indians, we never ran off to join the white people. And I always wondered, I mean, it sort of felt true I kind of liked the idea. I, I have to admit, I kind of hoped it was true, but I always wondered if it was true, right? And I sort of filed that in my mind. And am I romanticizing something? Is this just some myth that isn't? Well, m many years after that, I was, became a war reporter. I started in Bosnia in the, in the early 90s. I went to Afghanistan in 1996. That's um, back in 2000 with Massoud as he fought the Taliban in, in Badakhshan. Massoud was assassinated two days before 9-11. I rushed back, I was with his commanders as they took Kabul with our help, obviously. And then eventually I wound up with US troops in the Korangal Valley. And those of you who have seen Restrepo, you know, or Korangal, you know what a tough deployment that was. Um, a lot of casualties, an enormous amount of hardship. And the second platoon that I was with was up on this ridge. It was a 20-man position plus ANA. Um, no running water, no way to bathe for you know three, four weeks at a time. Um, some of their uniforms, their combat fatigues were in shreds. Um, uh, only MREs, uh, no communication with the outside world, no internet, no phone, no television, no electricity for the first few months. They slept in the dirt, shoulder to shoulder. They did everything together. Uh, and they endured an enormous amount of combat. And at the end of that, um, they made, obviously, a lot of very excited plans at the end of the deployment. Uh, those boys were out there for almost 15 months on that ridge. And at the end of the deployment, they made some very excited plans to return to Vicenza, Italy, where they're based. And, uh, you know, you can probably picture what that looked like when they got back. I won't describe it in detail. Um, but they had a pretty good time. But then the good time wore off, and something else set in. Um, not just PTSD, but something else, a kind of nostalgia. And one of them said to me, he said, you know, if a helicopter were to come tomorrow and pick us up and take us back to OP Restrepo, back to the Korangal, most of us would get on it. We don't want to go home. And suddenly I remembered my Uncle Ellis, and I remembered these stories about the frontier. You know, what is it? I mean, modern society is so obviously wonderful. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I'm really serious. Like, um, we have enormous convenience, and we're, we're really buffered from hardship. We have rule of law, philosophy, the arts. Um, what is it about modern society that is so unappealing to people who have been exposed to something else? And I thought in my book, I want to write a book that tries to explain that phenomenon. Like, what is it that people, when they say, I miss, I miss war, or when people don't want to, don't want to leave the, the tribal society they've been adopted into, what is it that they're hanging on to? I have to assume these are not mentally unhealthy people, that they're actually hanging on to something that's, that's good and human. 
um, I studied anthropology in college, and um, it occurred to me that out of Restrepo, what I was basically seeing was our evolutionary past. I mean, we know from archaeological evidence, for anthropologists, that most of human, most of human history, prehistory, pre has been characterized by people live, living in uh, mobile hunter-gatherer groups of 30, 40, 50 people, uh, sharing everything together, sleeping in a group, sharing, gathering and sharing food together, defending each other, uh, counting on each other for their physical survival and their, and their emotional survival. Um, what does that sound like? That's a platoon. That's a platoon in combat. Basically, a platoon in combat recreates our evolutionary past very, very well. And so my experience being out there, I mean, you'd think it would be horrible, right? Like, it's dangerous. I almost got killed out there a couple of times. Um, everyone, out, everyone out there had stories of a bullet that barely, you know, barely missed them, right? Everyone had stories like that. Um, it, it, in a lot of senses, it was absolutely miserable and terrifying, except in some ways it felt very good. And I, I, what, what was that thing that felt good? Why was I so relaxed out there? Why did I miss it when I came home? And I realized it's, I never, I grew up in a suburb. You know, I, I, look, you know, I didn't know my neighbors. I certainly didn't care about them, and I sure as hell wouldn't die for them. Um, and that is, to live that way, affiliated with the people around you, is what it means to be human. It's what we're wired for. Um, and when you, grow, when you live in modern society, there are very few opportunities to feel that way. And so when you take people who have that experience and then you pick them up and you drop them back down in modern society, they are probably going to struggle psychologically. That's probably going to be hard for them. And this is not, um, this is not a new problem. You know, first of all, we know that as wealth goes up in a society, the suicide rate goes up, the depression rate goes up. Uh, arguably, and one chapter in my book deals with this, the, the rate of PTSD goes up. And if you think about it, if, if exposure to, tr to trauma incapacitated or severely impaired a large proportion of people, right now in the US military, it's estimated to be 25% of the US military is affected by PTSD. If you think about our evolutionary past, if a large proportion of people were incapacitated by exposure to trauma, we wouldn't exist. I mean, how could we? You can't take out a quarter of the of our um, of a population of, of, of Stone Age hunter gatherers. You can't take out a quarter of the little group of fifty and have that group survive. So something's going on culturally, which is making it hard to re recover from trauma. Um, and it, th this is not a new problem. I don't know how many of you have seen a, a wonderful film uh, called uh, The Best Years of Our Lives. It's a black and white film about, uh, about veterans returning from World War II. And back then, people didn't have phones. Maybe they would send a telegram saying they're coming home. Their service lasted. A good friend of mine, her father was in World War II. And he went from North Africa to Sicily, Enzio, through Italy to France, all the way through France, all the way to Austria, and then they let him go home. And that was, that was just what happened. So his, families didn't know when people were coming home. They didn't get the phone call, right? Guys were literally walking you know, from the train station up you know, through their neighborhood. The train would get in at midnight or whatever, and, and they would be walking through their neighborhood, up their street, and to their house, and, and appearing unannounced. Imagine what that was like. And, it, and, and this film documents that. These four guys are going home. They're sort of dropping each other off. The first thing they do is they have a drink. Someone says some, what else at the bar says something disrespectful about the war. Um, so immediately, the first thing that happens, they get into a big bar fight. Um, they extract themselves from that, and they keep going. One guy gets out in front of his house. They wish him luck. The next guy, they pull up, and that guy says, he hesitates, and he says, can we just, can we get another drink first? And his buddy's like, no, man, your family's waiting for you. You've been gone three years. They don't even know you're back. They're right there. You got time to go home. And he takes a deep breath, and he says, I feel like I'm about to hit a beach. So he was, he was equating coming home with the experience of landing under gunfire 
uh, during an amphibious assault into enemy positions. That's what it felt like to him. So this, the transition home for soldiers, which is so difficult, um, is, is not a new thing. The, um, the rate of PTSD is puzzling uh, because, as you probably know, around 10% of the military is actively engaged in, in ground combat uh, and regularly being exposed to danger and to the trauma of seeing other people wounded and killed. And by other people, I mean their brothers and sisters in their ranks, but also the enemy and civilians. All of that is incredibly traumatic. And I know from my experience as a journalist, and I've, I've, ha I've dealt with PTSD several times after my assignments. The most psychologically deranging things that have happened to me ha haven't been the times that I've been put in danger, but the times that I've seen, that I've witnessed uh, harm, catastrophic harm coming to others. Um, I saw when I was with Masood in, um, in 2000, it was before, obviously before 9-11, I mean, it was a kind of World War I style combat going on. And he, you know, he, there was a, 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 a basically a, a, a massed infantry assault up a ridge through, through minefields into entrenched positions. And you can, you can imagine, right? And they pulled these guys who had gone through a minefield, they pulled them out of there and put them, they dumped them on a flatbed truck and drove the truck back to a field hospital and I was standing there, you know, right behind the front lines. I mean, the whole front was booming and thudding and crackling. And, um, and they brought these poor guys back, you know, just people just torn, torn in half. And, um, uh, and uh, when I came home uh, to New York for the first time in my life, um, I really, really had a psychological problem. And I didn't, you know, this was before 9-11, so, um, PTSD wasn't even a term that people used. And, you know, one day I was down in the subway and um, this is the first time I realized I had a problem. I just didn't know what to call it. I was down in the subway in New York City and I went into a full-blown panic attack for absolutely no reason. The train was going to jump the rail and, and, and plow through the platform and kill me and the crowd was gonna turn on me and kill me and the lights were too bright and the lights were gonna hurt me somehow and everything was too loud and everything was just maxed out in a way that made me think I was gonna die. And I was way more scared on that subway platform than I had been in, even in Afghanistan. And, and you know, back then, understand the Taliban, they had all the toys, right? They had MiGs. The Taliban had an air force, they had tanks, they had everything, right? And uh, so fighting them was, really, really frightening. And, um, and in addition, we'd seen these terrible things. And I was on the subway platform and I completely panicked and I ran out of there. And for the next few months, I could not be in a small space where there's too many people and I didn't have control. I didn't connect it to combat because that wasn't what combat had been, right? I mean, I wasn't on a subway platform in Afghanistan. You know, I mean, th there was just nothing that made me think, oh, this is, these circumstances are replicating combat. So I'm, this is because I was in combat. I must be I must have been traumatized. It never crossed my mind. Um, I just thought I was going crazy. I mean, I literally, I literally thought um, I was going mad. And I was so embarrassed by the fact that I was going crazy that I didn't seek help because I was too embarrassed. I was like, I, I mean, this is going crazy. Is, I mean, in my mind, I'm like, going crazy is embarrassing. I'm not gonna tell anyone about it. And we'll just, I'll just see what happens. And um, what happened to me is what happens with, um, psychologists will tell you statistically is what happens with most people who have been traumatized. Uh, it, it goes away. For most people, for around 80% of people who have been traumatized, um, they, they, they do not develop long-term PTSD. And eventually the problems eventually dissipate. Uh, and you have to understand, again, you know, think of us uh, as a product of evolution. We are wired to survive. Whatever our behaviors are, those probably served us well in our evolutionary past. Um, so if you're traumatized and suddenly you're jumping at, at sudden noises and um, you're, not sleep, you know, you're sleeping lightly at night and you're having nightmares about the thing, the thing that could kill you, you have nightmares that your life's in danger and you're depressed or you're angry, those are all adaptive 
adaptive behaviors. You know, you want to have nightmares about the thing that might kill you to remind you that, like, you're still in danger. Um, you, want, you want to react to unfamiliar noises. You know, that might be a tiger in the underbrush. You don't know. Um, so uh, um, depression keeps you um, out of, sort of out of circulation and, and not vulnerable to, um, to threats, and anger makes you prepared to fight. Now, of course, if, you, if those issues don't resolve, those are meant to be a short-term adaptation to danger to help you get through a dangerous period. If they wind up afflicting you your whole life, then that's not adaptive. It actually puts you in danger, in danger of suicide, for example, in danger of lifelong depression that incapacitates you and keep, keeps you from functioning. Um, but mo most people get over that, and, and, and I did. Um, one of the, and I'll just circle back to this statistic, around one of the interesting things about PTSD now in this society, in this military, is that around 10% of the military is engaged in combat, um, and around 25% of the military, one in four, is, uh, are, uh, um, one in four people have, are estimated to uh, uh, serve, serve, people who are serving and veterans are thought to have PTSD. So what is the, what, what's the gap there? Like wh wh how, could, how could they have PTSD if they weren't traumatized? And um, there's, a, there's a possibility that one of the things that's happening is that the, the transition home is actually what's traumatic. So if you look at Peace Corps volunteers, they're not traumatized. I mean, they're living in extremely arduous circumstances, but they're living in a close-knit community with other people they care about for a couple of years, right? They're, sleep, they're sleeping in, maybe sleeping in groups. They're dependent on other people that they see every day. They're part of that incredible social fabric that characterizes human society. Um, and then they're wrenched out of that and they're put back into modern society where they're on their own again. And because we're a social species, um, being alone, thinking that you're on your own, is the, the most frightening experience you can have. We're, 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 we're social primates. We don't, primates do not survive in nature by themselves. They die. Uh, humans and other primates, if they are alone in nature, unless you're a male orangutan, I think is the only exception that lives on its own. Uh, you are in extreme danger. One of the reasons that babies cry when they're put in a room by themselves is because infant primates in the jungle that are not attended by adults are, are someone, someone's lunch immediately. Um, so when you go from a close-knit situation of combat, even though it's a dangerous environment, you have the security of the group around you. And you go from that to modern society, which is safe, but you have no group around you. Ironically, it's modern society that feels more threatening. Think about the irony of that. Um, and, and that can play out in, um, in really complicated ways for people. Um, I, I had a uh, Facebook communication with someone who said he was a, a Vietnam veteran, and he was a LERP, a long range reconnaissance patrol. Some of you may know what that, they phased that out. It's a light marine force recon, only worse, I think. I mean, it's a very, it was a very intense job. These people were dropped in four-man teams behind enemy lines, no, no medic, no air support, and they were sometimes out there for weeks at a time. Um, and so this guy did several tours in Vietnam, and when he came home, he said he felt so out of place in American society um, that he didn't know if he could participate in it. He wasn't getting spat on, he wasn't, it wasn't that. He just didn't feel like he belonged. He felt like there was nothing to belong to. And the war ended, and, and he went back to Vietnam, and he married the daughter of a Viet Cong commander. He married a daughter of the enemy and moved into their village, and he finally felt like he belonged somewhere. And now he, he goes back and forth, and um, he's still married. Um, and, and he said, and he read my book, and he said, he said you know, you're exactly right. Like it's, you, we, we need to feel like we're part of something. And if there doesn't feel like something to belong to in this society, we will look for it elsewhere. And he, and he did. Um, I also talked to a, 
young woman who had survived cancer. Um, she said, she came up to me after a reading, after a talk that I gave, and, uh, and she said that she had gotten very, very sick, and her family, her friends, her community, her tribe had rallied around her while she was doing chemo and all that awful stuff. And, um, and she, she beat the odds. She survived. And her friends and family and her community went back to their lives, of course, and she looked at me really sadly and she said, now I miss being sick. So think about that. If you have people missing cancer, if you have people missing combat, um, there, there is something missing. So the big question is like, what, what can we do about it? How can we, how can we have it all? Um, how, how can we enjoy the blessings of this amazing society um, and somehow stir up in ourselves the communal connections that have kept people safe and made them, gave their lives meaning and, and made them feel, um, made them feel like they were a part of something important for hundreds of thousands of years. How can we recreate that even though we live in a, in a safe environment without much hardship to speak of? I don't know if it can be done. I know we're capable of it. It's wired into us, right? There's nothing special about tribal people. We are them. I mean, we have not changed physically in any significant way in 20,000 years. I mean, an infant born today is identical to an infant born 20,000 years ago. Even the, the agricultural revolution of 10,000 years ago has not even really begun to affect the human genome, barely. Um, so I know we're capable of it, and if you look at modern examples of modern society uh, where the system has sort of been collapsed temporarily, um, instantly we, that, that, that communal part of ourselves springs into action. Uh, after 9-11 in New York City, um, there was an amazing, this amazing feeling in the streets of, um, of brotherhood and sisterhood. I mean, every, I mean, strangers took care of each other and made sure, you know, in those days and weeks that followed, um, you know, you would ask people if they, if they looked like they were, I mean, you'd see people just like, even a week later, just sort of in shock, just sort of standing on the street corner, deep in thought, right? And, and you'd, go, you know, you'd go up and say, hey, are you all right? That kind of caretaking. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, in some ways, a little bit like what I did with that guy in the wheelchair. But we, we, were all, we were all doing it, and it felt good. And the suicide rate went down in New York after 9-11. It didn't go up, it went down. The murder rate, violent crime, it all went down. I mean, one of the really interesting things about humans is that bad circumstances produce good behavior. Um, if bad circumstances produce bad behavior, the species would have died out. But though that adversity and danger and hardship bring out, um, bring out the parts of ourselves that allow us to survive, which means the parts of ourselves that are affiliated with other people because we can only survive as a group. So that pro-group behavior, pro-social behavior is what comes out when the chips are really down. Um, and uh, so you can see, you know, you can see that um, throughout, throughout human history, the siege of Sarajevo, my first war in the early 90s, um, a modern army, the Bosnian Serb army, surrounded a modern city and used the civilian population for target practice for three years. And they killed and wounded a fifth of the city, 20% of the city. Uh, and I, w I was there during those terrible times, and people were living in basements and growing food in the median strips of highways. And, um, and I met, um, just a year and a half ago, I, I met a woman who had survived that. She was a 17-year-old girl when the war started. Um, she didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, she had a boyfriend, she was 17, whatever, whatever the adults are doing, doesn't matter. And then boom, a, t a Serb tank round hit her parents' apartment because they were just indiscriminately shelling the city, right? And uh, a piece of shrapnel almost took off one of her legs. And her father carried her through the shelling at night to the hospital. And the doctor was just gonna cut her leg off. And the, the, the father, her father pleaded with the doctor to try to save her leg, and he did. Uh, but he had to operate on her without anesthesia. There was no anesthesia in the city. She survived that. And many years later, a year and a half ago, uh, I, had, I had lunch with her, and we were talking about the war, and her name was Nizara, and, and she, 
she literally dropped her voice and said, you know, it's weird, the, w the war was so terrible, but we all miss it. She said, we missed the, pe we were better people during the war. We didn't think about ourselves, we thought about others. And we miss being those people. We don't need to be, we don't need to be good people anymore because the war's over and we're wealthy. And she said that there was um, graffiti, there was graffiti in Bosnia referring to the war that said things were better when they were bad. Um, that doesn't say something um, dismal, that says something hopeful. It means that human beings have the capacity to act, to act their best when other people need them. And then by helping other people, you actually increase your own chance of survival. That is why our species has survived. It's our, those, those are our highest virtues, and they're in all of us. In a moment, in an hour, in a day, we, can all, we would all turn into that person. And um, I'm, I'm supposed to talk, stop at 1.30, so I'm, I'm gonna stop and take questions. If, if no one asks me, how can we improve our society? If no one actually asks me that, I'll, <laughs> I will just uh, go ahead and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you for, for hearing me out today. It was a real pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll now open the floor for questions. If we have the capability to take questions from our BTC participants, we'll take the first two from them. Otherwise, for our local audience, please raise your hand. One of our assistants will bring you a microphone. Before asking your question, please state your name and tell Mr. Younger your affiliation with West Point. Thank you. Is it me or something? Oh, I guess, I guess that's me. Um, Mr. Younger, I'm a Cadet Paul O'Donnell, I'm in uh, battalion staff right now. I guess you opened up the floor for this. How can people be better? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, um, so there's two parts, you know, there's really two parts to the, to the answer. I mean, on the one hand, we're obviously, we, we're not going to, we wouldn't want to dismantle society, burn down the suburbs, live in lean-tos in small groups of 40 or 50 people. You know, I mean, I, you know, that, that no one's proposing that. It is important to understand that that's what we're wired for. So we, we, we have to acknowledge that living otherwise incurs a, a, a psychological stress for people. We're not wired for that, right? Um, but that, that said, how do we change a mo the modern society we've created um, into something that actually feels more communal, even though it's community, of 320 million, like how do we do that? Um, the, the Amish don't drive cars, so they live their lives within walking distance of most of the people they know, and they have very low rates of suicide and depression, and a very firm idea of their identity as a community is Amish. But how, so how can we, without banning the car, how can we sort of get that identity as Americans, as one community, that will bolster our sense of, of feeling like we belong to something, which is what all humans want, right? I mean, mean someone asked me, how do, you, how do you lead a life of meaning? And I said, well, meaning, meaning is doing something that affects the people around you, it affects them in good ways. That's what meaning is. That's what a meaningful life is. It's a life that affects those around you in positive ways. Um, so how, how do you do that in a nation of 320 million? And I, you know, I think there's a couple, of, a couple of things we can do. Um, in Israel, there's mandatory military service. Um, the PTSD rate is around 1%. Uh, this is a difficult thing to measure, and those are the lowest estimates, around 1%, at any rate, a lot lower than in this country. Um, and one of the reasons that psychologists told me was that there's mandatory national service. Um, Personally, I don't think it's moral to force someone to carry a gun if they don't believe in the, in the fight that they're fighting. Um, but I think it's entirely moral to demand that people participate in their country and give to it. And that uh, a year or two of mandatory national service with a military option would do, do, would do two things. 
it would um, take this amazing country we have that's so varied and so eclectic, but really quite segregated in a lot of ways, racially, so socioeconomic terms, regionally, very divided, very divided country at the moment. It would take all of those groups and put them in a big pot and stir them around, stir them up, right at an age, 20, 21, when people are the most open to uh, new experiences and forming new relationships. Um, I think that would be very, very healthy for this society. Um, and the other thing it would do, it was impre would impress upon people that you, as my father said to me when I was sort of, I asked him in, you know, I grew up during Vietnam, right? And I thought the draft had ended, and in 1980, I was 18. Every, I grew up in a really liberal family, and every adult I knew was against the Vietnam War, right? And so I, um, I got my selective service card in the mail, and I said to my father, like, I'm, I'm not signing this, right? Like, what is this? I thought the draft was over. I was really confused. I didn't understand it. And my father had grown up in Europe during World War II, and he said, no, you're signing that. And he was a huge pacifist, right? A huge pacifist. And he, and he said, look, there's thousands of American soldiers buried in, in his home country of France. He said, the US saved the world from fascism. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, you don't owe your country nothing. And you may owe it your life, hopefully not. And if a war comes along that you think is immoral, that does not need to be fought, then it's your moral duty to protest it. But it, it may be a war that has to be fought, and then it's your moral duty to fight it. You don't owe your country nothing. So, um, God forbid, the only way we have to serve our country is with a gun. There's many other ways to do it that are necessary during the long stretches uh, between, uh, of peace that we occasionally enjoy. Um, and so nas mandatory national service would allow people to serve their country, and psychologists know that if, some, if you put into something, if something costs you something, you value it more. And I think one of the problems right now is that the nation doesn't ask its citizens to put in anything. It doesn't even require that you stand in line to vote. It asks absolutely nothing. And so it is just a kind of unfortunate human psychology that if you don't sacrifice anything, you don't, if you don't make sacrifices for something, you just don't value it. Um, just that alone, I think, would go a long way towards creating a sense of unity within the context, not of Stone Age society, that's over with, but the modern society that we've created. Next, qu next question. Hello, sir. Cadet Christian Doyle, Company G3. Um, in your studies of PTSD, um, do you find that uh, what we're seeing today is, are we seeing a rise in, in these things? Is, this, is there a certain nature of modern warfare that's leading to a spike in PTSD? Or is this something that's been there all along that's just now getting more coverage? In, in, in your personal studies, what, yeah. what side of that would you take? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's... It's hard to tell because as you change the diagnosis criteria, you can effectively up the, up the diagnosis rates and suddenly it looks like the rate of PTSD is rising. Um, there's some, certainly something to that. One of the studies that I read though was um, that overall disability rates for physical and psychological issues uh, have steadily gone up while combat intensity has gone down and they should go in the same direction. So every war, thank God, combat intensity has gone down, casualties have gone down, and disability rates have gone up. So there is, there is, some, there is some disconnect between the intensity of warfare and at least the perception by vets themselves that they are uh, damaged, physically or psychologically. Um, and that's a... Uh, you know, possibly a cultural thing. And I, and, and, and I think one of the things that might be going on is that if you don't feel, okay, just to shift the terrain here a little bit, um, we all remember 2008, the financial crash, um, some illegal, certainly immoral, often illegal, definitely unethical and definitely unwise banking practices crashed the American economy. 
And the people that, com that, that did that to us, and it is fair to put it that way, the people that did that to us, relatively few people, about 45 miles south of here, at the bottom of Manhattan, um, they, they did that because they didn't consider the welfare of the United States to be relevant to their own interests. In other words, they thought if we can get away with this, we will. We, we're not invested in how the country as a whole is doing. In fact, if this gamble doesn't work, the country will bail us out, so why not, right? And the reason that those people were able to think that way is because none of us really, and I, I'm speaking broadly about the civilian population in this country, of course, None of us really see the nation as a coherent whole. So, so bankers can think, okay, well, you know, the, the US Treasury has a lot of money, you know, we'll get bailed out, and you know, it's, I mean, they're, they're, they're splitting up their idea of the country into sort of like different parts and not acknowledging that they were going to cost, that they have cost this nation $14 trillion, right? Every one of you in this room will owe $45,000 personally. That will somehow have to get paid back because of what those people did, okay? And then none of them went to prison, not one. Now, I'm not up here, you know, with a, you know, I mean, my message is not like change the economic system. I, I, we can all do, you all can do what you want, right? But, my, but, my, but there are consequences to doing things that way. Right? And one of the consequences is when you have people operating at that level where they don't seem to understand that, that their interests and the nation's interests are the same thing, when you have people at that level acting in selfish ways and there are no consequences, why wouldn't you put in for PTSD disability even if you, know, you may not you actually may think, well, I actually could work if I wanted to, but you know, may, why not? I mean, why not? It's $3,000 a month. When you have people ripping this country off to the tune of $40 million, why would people down the, lower down in the socioeconomic chain, why would they act well either, right? It sets an example, and there's no reason for any of us to act well because very powerful people aren't treating the country as if it mattered. And you know you would never steal, you would never steal food. You know if you were out camping in the wilderness with your family and you got lost and you were stuck out there, you know, and there's a little bit of food left, you would never steal. You know you would never like steal it from the family food supply, right? Like th that's ideally the country should think of itself like that, like one for all and all for one. And when you have very very powerful people violating that basic contract. Um, there's no reason for anyone else to abide by it. And, you know, seriously, I think people look, and I don't blame them. I mean, in some ways I say, go for it. You know, people look at that behavior and you're like, all right, if it's just a free-for-all, let's go for it. And so there are the, the restraints on, you know, may, I mean, the World War II generation, um, my friend whose father was in the service said, you know, it really it took a lot to get someone to ask the government to help them. Like, you really had to, like, lean on people to file for disability because they just didn't want to do that. Um, that has completely changed. There's some good things. I mean, those changes have brought some good things too. A lot of people really do need help. But like everything, there's a good and a bad. And, and, and the, ba the bad part of that is that we are losing our sense of being all in this together and people start to take out of it what they can. And that's terrible for everybody. I'm not a communist, by the way. <laughs> You're all looking at me a little stunned. I'm really not. <laughs> Any more questions? I got three more minutes. Don't make me call on one last, one poor, one last person. Hi, uh, Captain Ben Flores, Department of History. Um, based off your views, how would you explain the increasing rise of just nasty online behavior, uh, especially coming from veterans and uh, active duty members? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I, it was hard to hear with the audio. Say that again. Okay, uh, how would you explain the increasing rise of nasty online behavior with a lot of it coming from you know, yeah. veterans groups and active duty members? All right, I, I, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think the, the country is sort of devolving into special interest groups. And I think broadly, when you, um, when you gerrymander voting districts and you allow politicians to not actu actually have to answer to in a coherent way, answer to people who think differently or question, question them, uh, and then you have a, a, very divi divided, a very divided government, which really has polarized into uh, uh, you know, us versus them, which is abs an absurd paradigm. It's absurd. Like everyone's part, I mean, both political parties are partly right and partly wrong, and both are completely necessary to the functioning of this democracy. So the whole paradigm of like, we're not going to negotiate, no compromise, us versus them, is totally wrong and antithetical to a democracy. All right, but, but that's not how our, our that's not what's happening in the rhetoric of government and politics at the moment. So you have gerrymandered districts, politicians who don't have to answer to other people who think a little bit differently, um, us versus them political rhetoric, and you know, finally, and, and, you know, the, the internet, which can be just this enormous echo chamber for whatever tailor-made opinion group that you want to join. When you add all of those things together, plus a population which is sort of disappearing into their iPhones and really not even engaging with other people in the room sometimes. When you, when you have that happening in a nation, you, can, you make space for incredibly, um, you can make space for incredibly ugly rhetoric because it never gets countered. Your people deploy this ugly rhetoric in online communities where there's no dissenters. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a choir of the converted, right? And, and that's true on the far left, and it's true on the far right. It's true of veterans, it's true of anti-war, you know, it's true of everyone's doing it, and it's fracturing this country. And I don't know how to fix it, um, but I would say that if I'm understanding your question correctly, it's not just veterans, it's that the whole country is devolving into that. And again, there's this loss of the, this idea that, um, I mean, one of the guys in the platoon that I was with said, there are guys in the platoon, he said, his, the quote was, there are guys in the platoon who straight up hate each other, but we'd all die for each other. Um, the nation has to be able to encompass disagreement and discord and, and even people who don't like each other without losing some basic level of respect for all of us, for the, pre for the office of president all the way on down uh, to the very poorest of the poor. And if we can't do that, we will not survive as a nation. Like, we're the most powerful country in the world. No one can touch us. The only people, the only country that can destroy this country is this country. And I'm really serious about that. ISIS, ISIS can hurt us, they can't destroy us, we can. And that kind of, um, that kind of rhetoric is part of the, is a, is a kind of, it's a kind of poison in our bloodstream and we gotta figure out how to deal with it. I think that's my, Signal. Thank you very much, everybody. I really enjoyed talking to you. Mr. Younger, thank you for your time and your inspiring words. On behalf of MWI, SCPME, the United States Military Academy, the Reserve Officer Training Corps, we would like to present you with a small token of appreciation. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I love you. I, love you. Thank you. I want to close by thanking the Modern Warfare Institute under the direction of Colonel Leon Collins, SCPME under Colonel Scott Halstead, Major Caleb Phillips, and Lieutenants Carson Warnberg and Nick Truax for their efforts in organizing at this event. I also want to thank our tech support personnel, without whom none of this would be possible. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and participation. Please feel free to join Mr. Younger at his book signing immediately outside this auditorium following this event, Dismissed.